All right, everybody, yeah, welcome yeah. back. <laughs> we are uh, picking up our work here on S17, and um, Mr. Devon is going to walk us through um, a strike all amendment to the bill that um, I've been working on. Represent Byron, I've been involved in some conversations. I had asked for feedback on a couple of initial sets of language, um, some of which came from the department, um, got some feedback from Vermont Sheriff's Association and other stakeholders, uh, and tried to find a path that would invest in a position at the department um, that would help with training, professionalization, development of model policy. So you'll hear a new um, deputy director at the department referred to here. Um, and stepped back from the Senate as passed proposal around um, changes to the 5%. There were a couple issues there that I think you'll see addressed here. Um, I added a finding section in lieu of uh, and, and struck the section that was in the Senate as passed as pass language that would have created a couple of, I think, kind of catch all uh, category B conduct violations that I think were already kind of baked into category B um, from the testimony that we had heard. So I wasn't sure really what was new there. And I think the enumerated category B conduct, um, it seems like a lot of the folks we heard from preferred the specificity. Um, so I put in some findings here and uh, thought that that would help maybe people understand a little bit of why we're doing these things as opposed to other things that I've heard people ask us to do, like come up with a path to suspension or something like that. Um, so I could talk a lot more about this and will, but I think the um, prudent thing to do here would be to have Tim walk us through what's on the page um, and maybe focus on sort of the differences between this and uh, S17 as it came over to us. So thanks very much, Tim, for all your work on this. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, Chair uh, McCarthy. For the record, my name is Tim Devlin, Legislative Council. Before you, you have draft 1.3 of a strike call amendment from the committee um, to S17. And uh, just for reference, any of the changes between the Senate bill and this bill have been highlighted uh, to easily identify them. That doesn't mean everything in here is new language necessarily. Sometimes it restores it. Um, if there's any questions as to what's new or old language, just feel free and I can uh, stop and point it out. The first part of the bill is now, let's see, we have a new reader assistant heading uh, titled findings and section one is also titled findings. Um, this is session law that um, uh, lays out the intent of uh, the bill. Really. Sorry, I should say the findings. Uh, but quickly, I'll just note um, and reiterate what Chair McCarthy just said, that this replaces prior section, the uh, Senate's bill, which was titled Unprofessional Conduct of Law Enforcement Officers Reviewable by the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. In particular, um, the old language would have added two items to category B conduct for LEOs or law enforcement officers. One would have been H, gross negligence or willful misconduct in the performance duties. And the second one would have been um, subdivision I, abuse of powers granted through law enforcement officer certification pursuant to section 2358 of this title. Returning now back to the new language here, we have section one findings and um, Representative Hanger. Um, thank you. So um, in terms of that category B behavior, I'm looking at number two under the findings. I wonder if we should not um, enumerate, you know, what these um, these practices or um, behaviors are, and just say incidences of criminal and unprofessional behavior by elected sheriffs and sheriff's deputies have shaken the public's trust in the office of sheriff, because this almost limits us to those things, in my opinion. But there could be more. I mean, for instance, what if we did something else? I'd be fine with accepting edits to some of the findings. And just to, to be clear, the findings don't, they're kind of designed to provide anyone who's reading the bill or and our colleagues with a sense of sort of how we arrived at these policies. I, 
I'm not married to that language. I think that might be a great suggestion. Representative Boyd. Going off of that, rather than laying out some of the categories under category B, we just say category B conduct under whatever the VSA. See, I think here in the in the findings, I want us. I would prefer that we kind of stay more like up in the any reasonable person could understand what this was, as opposed to somebody who knew a lot of stuff about the law. Um, but yeah, these are all great things. What I'd like to do, try to do, is see what's on here first, and then we'll we'll go back through again and maybe write down some suggestions. So I think before we get too far in the weeds of trying to wordsmith this draft, if it's okay with everybody, get, get him through a pass through, and then we'll go back and and uh, do some notes and have some committee suggestions for a, an update. Uh, this is definitely sort of a a new clean start to conversations about what should be in the bill. So appreciate the initial feedback. I want to make sure we give Tim a chance to get through it at least once. <laughs> yeah. Chair McCarthy, would you like me to um, do a line by line of the newly added or highlighted text as we go through it or just um, summarize it and continue? Uh, I think um, I think a good level of detail. We've got a little bit of time. So if, sure. if you want to do a line by line on the new stuff, I think that's probably good just so everybody can kind of read it through carefully together at the first pass. Absolutely. So on line eight, the updated section one, we'll now read uh, title findings. Again, this is session one, uh, we'll read. The General Assembly finds that one, sheriffs provide essential public serv safety services to the state, counties, and communities of Vermont. Two, incidents of criminal and unprofessional behavior by elected sheriffs and sheriff's deputies, including excessive use of force, embezzlement, assault, and questionable financial practices have shaken the public's trust in the Office of Sheriff. Three, the Office of Sheriff requires reform to provide more consistent structure, financial practices, accountability, and increased transparency. Four, while criminal charges or misconduct may lead to sanctions on Vermont sheriffs, including de decertification by the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, removal from office can only be achieved through expiration of term, resignation, or impeachment by the General Assembly. The next part of the bill, it regards audits. And section two um, has been updated, specifically the amendment to Title 24 VSA, section 290, uh, titled County Sheriff's Department, subsection D. And just briefly, uh, this rewrites the section so that one, when a sheriff signals uh, intent to leave office, they will provide a written transition plan and two, the county's assistant judges will consult with the Department of Sheriff's, um, uh, with the Department uh, of State's Attorneys and Sheriff's and the Sheriff's Executive Committee um, when it comes to the transfer of any assets during that transitional period. The new language as modified will read subsection D, on the election of a sheriff elect who is not the incumbent sheriff, an announcement that the uh, comma, an announcement that the incumbent sheriff will not seek a re-election or an announcement that the incumbent sheriff intends to resign, whichever occurs earliest, the outgoing sheriff shall provide a written transition plan detailing all financial disbursement from the accounts of the department, including the transfer of real or personal property or other assets of the department to the county's assistant judges who, in consultation with the Department of Sheriff's Executive Committee, uh, shall provide written approval prior to any sale or transfer of the items identified in the plan. A copy of the approved plan shall be filed with the auditor of accounts and the assistant judges within 15 days after completing the outgoing sheriff's deputies after the sheriff leaves office. And um, just a quick question about the word audit. I think we heard that in one of the testimonies that um, it doesn't necessarily or shouldn't necessarily have to be a full audit every time. Do we need to specify that because there is an associated cost with a full audit versus a partial audit? So I believe, and we should follow up on this, that in this section, we're talking about the already required audits that, that happen. But what we're really doing is expanding, um, not so much in um, 
in this piece, what we're doing is basically saying that the existing audit structure is going to cover and have this additional period uh, or or sort of additional trigger uh, of having um, the announcement that somebody's going to retire, then go to okay, we need to have a plan, and there's going to be on any you know major financial transactions this sign off from the county officials, the side judges. So. Um, we should take a little bit more testimony. This was language that came from the department, uh, actually, and then had a further modification in the initial draft we were talking about yesterday. So Rory, um, you know, touched on this yesterday, and I think we want to hear from them a little bit about those mechanics. Um, I do remember Representative Marwicki in the comments yesterday talking about maybe we need to specify which level of audit. That was a suggestion from yesterday that didn't make it in here. So it's something we, I think, should flag as a note that we want to continue to, to think about. I was hesitant to try to like go down that rabbit hole with Tim yesterday at last night when I was trying to do a lot of other things, but I think it's a valid suggestion. My understanding, Tim, is that um, the section that you just read, uh, that alone isn't going to, to trigger a new set of audits. No, I don't believe it would. Okay. I think you'll recall that in the testimony we've heard a, a few times that right now there's the requirement that there be an audit every other year of the sheriff's offices, and then when um, uh, there's a transition. Exactly. This right. is specifically the transition. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. It yes. says it transition. Yeah. Okay. Then that. So when they, that it's known that question. someone announces that they're not running again, etc. This is specific to that transition period. Okay. Yep. That as long as that transition is in the original uh, intent. Yeah. So the, the existing current practice is that that audit happens. Now the auditor did ask us, and I haven't addressed it in this draft. Um, did ask us to look at the idea of if there's a you know an audit with that if we just did the biennial audit and then there's going to be a transition or resignation do we really need to do another full audit okay. i think that specifically is a really good area where we could probably get all the transparency we want out of this without having to do a complete second audit and the way it's set up right now especially if a sheriff resigned unexpectedly or there was a transition unexpectedly there could be in theory the idea of having to do another full audit within you know, a couple of months of having just done a biannual audit. So that might be something that we want to address to you. So I think let's put a big sticky note on okay. audits. <laughs> I think there may be a little bit more language that refers back to this in the next section, but uh, okay. Thank you. we probably have some more work to do on this area. And one other note I'd just like to uh, uh, make briefly on line 18 is a reference to the department. But you probably specific reference to the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Yeah, if you want to make that update in subsequent drafts, then that's that'd be great. The next section, section three, um, is actually the particular statute regarding audits um, made by the other accounts to the Sheriff's Departments um, and is a slight modification from what the Senate had proposed. Um, this will modify or further amend Title 24 VSA, Section 290B, Title Audits. You'll see a highlight on line 19, which adds the words or participant to a lesson. So Section 9, uh, for context, we'll read. Um, sorry, let me back up a little bit. The uniform system of audits shall include procedures to notify the auditor of accounts in the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs of the establishment of activities of any non-public organization of which the sheriff is an employee of the sheriff is a director, new language, or participant, and that has a mission or purpose of supplementing the efforts of the sheriff's department. And that's the only difference in that section. The next particularly had a question before you move on. Just kind of that's kind of a big difference, isn't it? It is. So um, this suggestion uh, the department touched on yesterday in testimony from them and to zoom out to the context we heard way back um, and I think the Senate took more testimony on this that some of the sheriff's organizations have um, a nonprofit or a booster as it's commonly called attached and so this would just expand to, to say that if there's a sheriff 
uh, or an employee of the sheriff's department and they're running that nonprofit or participating in that nonprofit and its mission is supplementing the efforts of the sheriff's department that the auditor scope that there would be procedures for the audit to say, where is that money coming from and how is it being used? Because if you're sort of taking the public office of sheriff and you also have this other entity that's collecting revenue that's going in, that it should, mm -hmm. the, those audits should sort of capture that activity. Uh, so the yeah. department itself came up with that? Yeah, the, yeah, the department of state's attorneys and sheriffs just suggested we add the word or to that language. The other language here that's new came from the Senate has yeah. passed. Mm -hmm. So the board participant was a suggestion from the Department of State's attorneys. And just for the live situation with this, the Addison County Sheriff's Department had a 501c3 that they started as sort of a secondary way of revenue, donation, money for the department that was kind of, it created this sort of like bifurcation for like oversight of the money and flow. So this just off, also offered clarity that it was like not just about directors, but the participants within these. So if they weren't a named director, but they were a participant, you know, it was just, it, it, this is really closing loopholes to a okay. interesting practice. Thanks. Yep. <clears throat> The next part of the bill, which uh, varies from sorry, it's the amendment, which will vary from the Senate proposal, is on page four. And this adds a new um, reader assistant heading conflict of interest, which actually wasn't in there before. Um, but this will modify parts of section four, which will um, add a new section to Title 24, <coughs> the, uh, 315, Title Conflict of Interest. <laughs> A conflict of interest. Um, we'll see that there's let's see um, two, three <laughs> sections that are highlighted. Just want to quickly mention that D is actually not new language. We just updated the. Um, it was E before, but this one was that highlight should will be removed in future versions. Um, the new language will more so uh, bootstrap existing state code of ethics the state code of ethics, um, rather than really creating uh, a fully parallel uh, conflict of interest code, more or less. Um, reading the language, new subsection A will read, the state code of ethics and associated definition set forth under Title III VSA sections 1201 through 1205 shall be applicable to sheriffs and deputy sheriffs. A conflict of interest may exist when a sheriff's or deputy sheriff's immediate family, or the sheriff's or deputy sheriff's business associate, or an organization of which the sheriff or deputy sheriff is affiliated, interferes with the proper discharge of a lawful duty. Subsection B has not been altered uh, from the Senate. Again, I don't know if you want to take the time to do this now. I, I don't understand that, uh, that, that piece at all, as far as what, what, is it, what does it mean that, that these affiliates interfere with the proper discharge. I'll give me an example of how that could happen. I just, I don't understand. I don't understand that whole section. Sure. Um, the state code of ethics is largely couched. Uh, the types of conflicts it describes are pecuniary or financial for the most part. And so hypothetically, I suppose um, a sheriff or deputy sheriff could be affiliated with an organization which has some sort of um, financial stake uh, in the outcomes of a duty uh, that the law, uh, that the sheriff could be um, employing at the time, um, uh, maybe in contracting, uh, classic example, nepotism, you know, contract goes is RFP, request for proposals, uh, uh, receive a proposal from um, a friend, family member, something like that might be marked as inappropriate and would provide um, suboptimal um, results based on choosing something uh, for a financial interest or, or familial uh, crafts there. I think the, That's one example. The request we heard from the sheriff who testified um, and was supported by the department was this question around the conflict of interest 
a language that was in F-17 was entirely novel. Like it was just a new conflict of interest policy for specifically for sheriffs. Um, they were saying we could accomplish the same thing and have, um, it would be comparable to the other elected officials that are covered by the state code of ethics if we just did something like this. I think before we moved anything like this, I'd want to hear from Director Sivrid and other folks about how does this actually work in practice. It's a really good question that you're asking Representative Higley because um, I think mean, we haven't done in this year much work around ethics and there are lots of you know conversations coming up because of stuff that's happening in the press about what is the ethics commission's role and what do they do and sort of how much power do they have. And one of the questions that I kept asking was if we go to the, the, the state code of ethics, and there's really a serious, you know, complaint about ethics, you know, could that also be a complaint from the Justice Council? So um, I think having Director Sivrit and either Chair Sorrell or Director Simons in here too to talk about how all these things were linked uh, would be important for me. Take a good action. Thanks. Subsection B uh, has not been altered. Subsection C does have new language and reads, the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs shall establish procedures for forwarding ethics complaints from any sources to the State Ethics Commission based on the procedures set forth in Title III VSA Section 1223. And then D, um, again, this is actually not the length, new language was erroneously highlighted, um, but was just kind of moved up. Well, it's there. The next part of the bill, let's see, pertains to Sheriff's Department's compensations and benefits. This was a reading assistant thing that was updated. Uh, it was, I think it was called contracts before. Um, for the purposes of being more factually uh, or descriptively accurate, as it was called the Sheriff's Contracts. The Section 5, um, Amends Title 24 of the SA. Sorry, I don't want to jump the gun, but what you're just going to start to say is a town, city, village, or county. And I wonder if this section refers to contracts with anyone else other than a municipality. Like, wouldn't a sheriff have a, a contract with, for instance, a school or a hospital? Great question. And this whole section does refer to all contracts. Uh, the amendments to subsection B, uh, let's see, B and its subdivision four, um, inserting city, village, and county, that was just the update some dated terminology. Okay, so it does not restrict contracts to just those. More to this 291A contracts that we're not seeing. That's my frustration with reading bills that are condensed like this. Thank you so much. Yeah, the, the part legislative council always has to make a decision about how much existing underlying law they want to write up. Mm -hmm. So, thank you, Tim. <laughs> so, uh, you'll see new highlighted text on page six in subsection C. Essentially, the changes here will restore um, uh, or really preserve current statutory language. So, you'll see it's not highlighted. That's on the books right now. And we'll add constraints for the use of that 5% um, figure and funds from those um, and how they will be expended, really tying them to following a model policy to be created and maintained by the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. So Tim, I just, uh, before you go through the, the, I just wanna make sure I'm orienting the committee to what happened here, because it can be a little confusing. So, after the extensive testimony we've heard about the 5% um, and the concern that the language that the Senate has passed used created this new idea that the 5% was an administrative overhead fee, that it was like a separate fee and wanted it put in a separate account from other um, funds that were received by the sheriff. Um, and there were questions about the, um, the way that that fee language would be interpreted by um, the auditors, frankly, um, and that how the maintenance of those separate accounts um, could be challenging. And I asked witnesses, and we repeatedly kind of kept coming back to this thing, 
what problem are we trying to solve? And I think the, the real concern was, um, as we heard from, you know, the conversation about the $400,000 bonuses and the sort of discrepancies in what sheriffs are being paid, that there isn't a consistent policy about how sheriffs are compensated and benefits are paid for. Um, and so I asked legislative council to restore the 5% language and underlying law. So that's what most of this section C does, right? So you'll see that there's no highlights or there's no underlining of the most of that highlighted, but then add on this new sentence, which is a reference to a model policy, which you're gonna see in the upcoming section. So just wanted to orient the <laughs> committee to what I asked legislative yeah. council to do. So what we're doing is restoring the policy that exists today with the 5%. So shares still have that flexibility to include overhead in their contracts, um, but then putting some limits on how these kinds of funds can be used um, in regard to benefits and compensation. So I'll turn it back over to you, Tim. Thanks for sidebar. Of course. And um, I'll just pick it up from line 16 with the to be new statutory language. Funds derived from changes for the contract administration of a contract shall only be used for sheriff sheriff, deputy, or other departmental employee compensation, bonuses, salary supplements, retirement contributions, or employee benefits in accordance with a model policy created and maintained by the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs. And the... Thank you. Quick question. What that means is that the administrative charges for the contract can only be used for um, personnel and their benefits, but the contract payments um, are, can be used for equipment, vehicles, maintenance of the facility, those types of things. So as written, um, a contract between a party and a sheriff's department can have a certain um, allowance built into it to cover the administrative costs or costs associated with administration of that contract. Um, the remaining, um, I guess, intake uh, of funds received from the contract, I don't believe there's anything in statute in here anyways, um, that really limits how those funds once received would be expended in turn. So it's just the administrative costs derived from that contract, a, a small piece, up to 5%, um, that can be used only for personnel and their benefits. If the rest of the revenue they're getting from, say, a contract with a school um, was needed to supplement like employee salaries or whatever, which I'm sure it would be, that's okay for them to use. But that 5% can't be used for the other department costs like equipment and facilities and cruisers and that type of thing. Yes, I agree with that. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think the, the thing, I think your question is getting at Representative the Hango that I wanted to ask clarity for Tim is that we're not limiting the ability for the sheriff to use or any sheriff to use funds derived from that administrative 5% um for any of the other things that would reasonably consider administration here we're just silent on that but what we're saying is if you're going to use funds that are derived from this overhead for benefits and compensation it just needs to be in accordance with the model, model policy so if you're use if you're using it for this you have to follow the model policy so it's i think that we're silent here unless i'm misunderstanding the construction on the ability to use that administrative fee for, you know, buying a vehicle or, you know, some other expense that I could be. I do used. not think that's. I think I'll point out, uh, I think if that is the intent, I think this may need to be redrafted to better reflect that. Okay. Um, as written, and this is something that uh, perhaps was an error on our part, was um, so funds derived from changes charges for the contract administration that five percent fee really of a contract shall only be used and this is shall only I think it was a may before 
And so we changed that internally. Uh, for yeah. So it's about what it. the shell modifies. Yeah. Right? I was trying to have it modify, you know, to connect the, if, if, you know, if, if you're using it for these things, then you have to follow the model policy. And I think if the, if the only is modifying, it just, yeah, it's, it's unclear. We just need to clarify that yeah. somehow. So we can certainly it's probably do. my fault in suggesting language that wasn't clear in the first place. Representative Hango. Thank you. So if you're not intent, if the intent isn't just for personnel and their benefits, then I would say get rid of that whole section and just say, in accordance with the model policy created, shall be used only in accordance with the model policy created and maintained by. Yeah. So, uh, we're going to get into what model policy we're referring to here in a future section coming up. So let's just say that noted that this isn't as clear as I had hoped it would be. Uh, and we'll, that's why we do this. <laughs> why we're here. We'll, we'll come back. Yeah. We'll, we'll try to clear this up uh, and not try to wordsmith it online, but uh, duly noted that that is, uh, didn't quite nail it on the first, uh, <laughs> first pass. And I, I think it can be easily adjusted to uh, address that concern. Thanks, Tim. Come back to that. Um, F, or sorry, new section um, will be added to this bill, uh, particular section 5A, uh, page 7. And this actually replaces uh, the prior uh, 5A put in by the Senate, um, which replaces the use of administrative overhead funds in section, sorry, in the years 2023. In 2024, and that had been added by um, House appropriate or Senate appropriations. It will replace it with Sheriff's Department's compensation and benefits model policy. I'll pause for a second. Representative. So I had that flagged earlier. Um, 5A line 11 after receiving approval from the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Um, if they are already providing input, which they are on line nine, why do they need to be the overarching approval body when back in the section we just discussed lines 19 and 20 and 21 says in accordance with the model policy created and maintained by the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs. That to me is a little bit of just I don't know if it's overkill or it's um, one body giving approval over what they've already created, which just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I had flagged that before we had the previous discussion. Yeah, so we'll, we'll probably have some policy debate about this when we really dig into committee discussion. Uh, I feel pretty strongly that I want the Criminal Justice Council, which has the broader view on what's appropriate for law enforcement model policies and, and various levels of expertise and input from people who aren't so closely associated and focused with the particular departments that the policy covers to bring in the ideas about, you know, international best practices on, on the management of law enforcement. I, I want them to approve the policy. Uh, but that's something that this committee can have a debate about. Representative Boyden. Uh, thank you. I think what you just said makes a lot of sense, but I also agree with that Senator Hanko that Possibly flagging uh, section five and C of that was the bottom lines of 18 and 15. That maybe it should be created and man maintained by the Vermont Criminal Justice Council to go off of the point that you just said, because they really emphasize best practices. Yeah, I think um, we're one of the things that I was really worried about and that I try to address throughout this. And I think we'll, we'll need to clean up that language in that C section on that point to Representative Boyden. Um, the, we have a body that does model policy creation that says what the standards and practices are that certifies law enforcement that hears complaints and that's criminal justice council. But then we also have 
the um, sort of administration and support and uh, and so there's this thing of, I, I think it's really good to not muddy the waters and if I've done that here inadvertently um, then I think that's part of our work over the next few days is to clean that up but I want to make sure that you know model policy input and creation and approval happens with criminal justice council but that the administrative support here we're investing in the department and where those things sort of touch, uh, we'll have to clear up the language. Okay. Thanks, Tim. The language of 5A, again titled uh, Sheriff's Department's Compensation and Benefits Model Policy. Subsection A reads, on or before January 1st, 2024, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, after receiving input from the sheriffs, the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, the Auditor of Accounts and the Department of Human Resources, and after receiving approval from the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, shall issue a Sheriff's Department Compensation mo Benefits Model Policy. Subsection B, the Sheriff's Department's Compensation and Benefits Model Policy shall address the structure and use of funds for compensation, bonuses, salary supplements, retirement contributions, and employment benefits for sheriffs, sheriff's deputies, and other departmental employees. Pause there. The next section is a new section to be added, 5B. And in essence, this will create a new position of deputy director of sheriffs, which will provide financial support to sheriffs. It will amend Title 24 VSA Section 367, which is titled Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, adding a new subsection E, and subdivision one reads, the executive director of the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs in consultation with the Sheriff's Executive Committee shall appoint a deputy director of sheriffs who shall serve at the pleasure of the executive director. Subdivision two, the deputy director of sheriffs shall administer sheriff's department's benefits and payroll, provides centralized support services for the sheriffs with respect to budgetary planning, training, and office management, and perform such other duties as directed by the executive director. Subdivision three, the deputy director of sheriff shall create and maintain policies addressing the structure and use of funds for compensation, bonuses, salary supplements, and retirement contributions, and employ benefits for sheriffs, sheriff's deputies, and other departmental employees. Sheriff, Sheriff's deputies and other departmental employees shall comply with these policies. Um, willful failure to comply with these policies shall constitute gross professional misconduct and be category B conduct pursuant uh, to 20 VSA section 2401 subsection two. Representative Engel, sir. Thank you. So again, this section, subsection three, um, the director of sheriff shall create and maintain policies is in contradiction to what your intent is in section five that the CJC is going to create these policies. So I don't want to get into the weeds of that if we're going to have a further conversation. I would like to flag that I'd like to hear from the Department of the State's <clears throat> Attorneys and Sheriffs about this new position and why it would be necessary when they have a structure that governs sheriffs and state's attorneys already, because I don't know enough about their office to really comment on whether this is a necessary position or not. And I know we're going to go into that further. So I'll let him go on with that. I'll say at a high level, the state's attorney, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, as we heard from Annie Noonan, from John Campbell repeatedly, really just right now, all they do is pay the sheriff's salaries and maintain the um, state uh, employees who are the transport deputies. They, there is no administrative structure. There's no press professional support. They do not train sheriffs. They do not tell the sheriffs how to run their offices. And um, I think that the, the piece about who creates and maintains policies and cleaning up that language would be um, really important. And I, I take that uh, as a really valid um, cleanup that we need to do on this language. 
But the general idea here is that we would establish a person who, like the state's attorneys, have some support, would now provide some consistent support. And, you know, what we heard from the Sheriff's Association was like, hey, we know we have some people that come into this office and they don't really have the financial knowledge to do some of the things we might want them to do. We know that there's inconsistency in the way some of these offices are doing things like reporting ticket data because there's you know limited computer skills. Wanted to have a person in a position where they could look at the policies around these issues across the sheriff's departments and provide some consistent professional support um, and also be in a position to potentially prevent some of the conduct that we've seen, right? Because they can be out there saying, hey, sheriff, why you, uh, it seems to be that, you know, the auditor made this recommendation from your predecessor. Why don't we clean up some of those practices and make sure you're doing it consistently with what everybody else does? There's a, the, all of the work that they do in those areas from what we've heard is kind of informal through the sheriff's association. Uh, and so this would be a person who would support the sheriff's in a way that there really isn't any kind of structure right now. For that's understandable. Thank you. I just want to hear from them okay. what their current situation is and, and how this adding another person would affect their operation. And, uh, if you'd like, I can speak to Representative Hingo's first concern about the conflicting mm -hmm. authorities there. Uh, this uh, sections 5A and 5B presume that the new deputy um, director wouldn't be hired immediately. And so it would provide the, um, an interim body that's states uh, DSAS and after receiving uh, input from those other entities uh, to create something by January 1st. And then perhaps afterwards, the deputy would be um, installed and then they could create or modify um, policies going forward after that point. That still doesn't address where the CJC comes in in terms of oh, maintaining, sure, not that, yeah. creating, creating and maintaining those policies. But thank you, Tim. Yeah, yeah I think I think we can clear this up. I mean, it's because there's the initial piece of there isn't going to be a director for this period of time. We do want a model policy to be developed. And then once it's in place, we want that director to help sort of make sure people are adhering to it, but I don't, I don't know if we necessarily need that uh, deputy director to be creating new policy. So I, I think that point's well taken, Representative Andrew will. Well, I actually would prefer that they did the policy creation and main, maintenance, but you've already made it very clear that you want the CJC to be in that role. So I'm just trying to build this bill in a way that's consistent so everybody knows what's happening. Yeah, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm very cognizant that this isn't a perfect first draft, but I'm trying to sure. get something on the table that I think is much closer from what I'm hearing from all of the, the chairs in the department to mm -hmm. what they could support because they were really not in support of S-17 mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> as it came over from the Senate. So I'm, uh, I, I think we have some more work to do on this for sure, and I'm not, I'm not wedded to this exact construct, so we should definitely keep talking. The next section is a new section 5C. This is at the bottom of page eight. And this is session law, which will have the effect of um, really creating a position. Uh, it's titled Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Semicolon position, subsection A. The following position is created in the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. One full-time exempt deputy director of sheriffs, subsection B. The deputy director of sheriff shall be funded by a charge assessed on each sheriff's department. So, um, do we have any idea how that assessment will be prorated or for each department? It is not yet defined here. I would say uh, this is a work in progress, and uh, the the general gist of what I'm going for here is uh, that I think that generally the sheriffs would prefer to have the position and professional support than lose all the flexibility uh, around how they use their overhead funds. And so 
part of the sort of balance that I'm creating here is having this extra layer of support and potentially accountability um, be paid for by them. So there's a, a little bit of a balancing act that needs to happen there. Uh, and we'll have to flush that out. It, this is definitely not enough to see, completely seal that problem. Representative Hingo. Thank you. So the point I'd like to make on this, on letter B, that they are funded by, that this position is funded by a charge assessed on each sheriff's department. I think I heard from several of the sheriffs that we heard from that their departments have very little money. Um, I don't know where they're going to come up with this money to pay this deputy director. And we, the legislature, are creating this position. So I'm not sure why they have to pay for it and why it cannot be part of the state budget. So um, without maligning any particular sheriff's office or how they run their office and recognizing all of the, the challenges that we've heard here, the, my preference rather than doing this reform bill would be to completely change the way sheriff's offices work. And I don't think we're prepared to do that. I don't think they're prepared to do that. And I think that would be enormously disruptive. I think that the majority of the folks in this building who've been trying to address some of the issues here. Okay. <laughs> We're holding it. Yeah. No, nobody's allowed to walk out of the the, <laughs> the majority of folks in this building who have, have been trying to find a way through these recent incidents and address some of the public concern around accountability and transparency with sheriff's offices, um, they would like to just cut off any money that those sheriffs have. Mm -hmm. And I agree that they're, that's probably not the best way forward. And so as a, as a attempt to satisfy the concern about some of that accountability, I want to create this position. I also think there's a, nexus between the fact that sheriffs are, you know, they're kind of an entrepreneurial, you know, independent entity. They're public, but they also have a lot of independence where we tell them, go out, get contracts, run your business. Um, some of them do that really well and have big cash on hand, and some of them don't. Um, and I uh, believe that the association will come back to us with a proposal about how to do this in a way that doesn't um, sort of punish the smaller agencies that are strapped. But um, I feel pretty strongly that this is moving in the direction of the sheriff's position on this and wanting to invest in professionalism as opposed to sort of getting their uh, flexibility around administrative overhead, getting uh, squeezed to the point where they don't have the ability to to fund themselves in a sustainable way. So it's a balancing act and I don't think we've quite nailed it, but I think that the sheriffs will come to us over the next few days with some recommendations about how to flesh this out and say, how would we pay for this position? I think, I think that they'll be supportive of the construct, but there's some details that just aren't in this initial draft. Understood. And I appreciate that you understand the small departments that may not be able to, I mean, we're, we're giving essentially giving them back the 5% that the Senate wanted to take away from them. Mm -hmm. And now we're telling them, well, you have to take some of that 5% and you've got to pay for this new position that we're creating. That's, right. that's the big picture that I'm seeing. So but hopefully we can come to some kind of compromise with them. Yeah. So I, just to put it in a sense of scale though, if you have 14 sheriffs covering one new position that let's say it's the whole thing with salary benefits and an office costs $150,000 a year. You know, we're talking about a little more than $10,000 if it was, if that fee was assessed evenly across all the departments. So we're not talking about a huge investment in, in this one. I would hope it would be sort of a prorated charge for each department as well, um, because certainly little, you know, Little county should not be paying as much as big county. Representative uh, Chase. Prorating based on the number of deputies or the district size? I would probably go by contract contracts. So, and I'm just, this is 
right off the top of my head, like maybe if a department only brings in $200,000 worth of contracts, they pay a percentage, whereas a department that brings in a million dollars worth of contracts pays a bigger percentage of their contracts towards this position. I, I just, I don't even know. That, that was a brand new thought to me. I, th I think we may hear some suggestions that from the, the sheriffs and the department themselves over the next couple of days, that then next great. week we yeah. can we can further have this conversation to figure out which direction we want to go. At this point, I was like, here's an idea of this position. The sheriffs will fund it somehow, recognizing that I hadn't spelled all, out, <laughs> all the details out in this first draft, but it, I, I anticipate some suggestions coming our way soon. The next new section is section 5G, and this is uh, page nine at the top. Uh, this will add to the list of individuals being transported by transport deputy, um, specifically juveniles being transported to court or to a court order facility. You can see the new language on line four, and I just highlighted the entire uh, statutory section, um, just as it appears its entirety, it's new uh, from the Senate version, but you can see just that new language is on the added part. And uh, I don't know a whole lot about this language. Um, we're gonna have to hear uh, the Department of uh, State's Attorneys and Sheriff's requested this for clarity, so uh, we'll have them testify to it, but Representative Hinkle. Thank you. Um, is there anything, and this may be out of your wheelhouse, Tim, um, that says that when a juvenile is being transported or held somewhere that they need to have more than one adult present. Uh, the reason I ask that is I understand that in some sheriff's offices, there are juveniles being held overnight or over the weekend for lack of a better place to put them. And there have to be two um, correctional officers of some kind or law enforcement officers rather with them. And I don't know, I don't know if this applies to the transport part, but I think maybe we should hear from DCF or somebody on that as well, Mr. Chair, because I think there are different regulations around working with juveniles than working with adults. <clears throat> It's fair. I'll try and work with some of our colleagues to figure out who the appropriate folks are to testify on that. And I have one additional question about this section. Sure. We heard from the judiciary, I think, maybe not, maybe somebody else, that we need more deputies to do transport if they're going to be mandated to do transport. And where are these deputies going to come from? I mean, some departments are really, I think ours in St. Albans are really down on employees right now. So where are we going to get them and who's going to pay for the extra um, mandated jobs that they're going to be doing? I heard less concern about the sort of specifying the duties of what the transport sheriffs do. And there's obviously the labor concern yeah. across all law enforcement right now. But that the really big challenge that was in S17 that's coming up um, that's related to this, but it's not exactly um, addressed in, in this section, is the mandate about coverage of courthouses. Um, yeah. That that actually was the biggest point I think of friction, um, and uh, there's a real desire. So, not knowing exactly how to resolve that without doing more. Uh, there's a report in here that I've asked for because right now recall that there's um, the use of private security. Uh, there's per diem um, courthouse security that are uh, payments to sheriffs and then there are some deputies that are permanently assigned to the courthouses from some sheriff's departments and so there's inconsistency and in some of the courthouses don't have coverage and it holds things up and so you know, we heard from the uh, judiciary administrative staff uh, and, and Judge Zone that you know, they'd like us to invest more. The budget recommendation had more money, um, and it was about the rates. And then what's been brought in testimony to us was this idea of adding positions 
And I didn't feel comfortable, at least in this first draft, saying, oh, yes, I know exactly which, how many positions would cover the gaps. And I had questions um, that I would love to ask of um, both some of our colleagues and, you know, Terry Persons and um, about, you know, what would, what would it look like to phase in and add on to the sort of state employed people the way we heard requests from Representative Oliver. So it's just such a big question and it pulls the budget in such a way that I didn't want to. So I kind of put a placeholder report in here. <laughs> we might have to figure that out next year. Maybe there's a way in the next couple of weeks for us to sort of start moving in that direction. Um, but there is money in the budget to increase the financial support for um, uh, courthouse security, at least that was in the, the request that came over from House Judiciary, is my understanding. Okay, so um, I did hear 25 the number 25 thrown out there that new new positions are needed for these particular functions. Are we mandating that now deputy sheriffs whose primary responsibility for transportation of prisoners, persons with a mental condition or psychiatric disability will now need to also I'm mandating that they will now need to be the ones to transport these juveniles. That's what the addition of this language is. Is that correct? Um, I don't know if it would mandate it so much as just clarify that if they are transporting it, um, those individuals, the juveniles, that is, they shall be paid by the state of Vermont. And perhaps I misstated that earlier, but it's really about um, clarifying who will be paying okay. those transport. Okay, great. Um, and just as an aside on the workforce shortage, I also heard that correctional institutions are now saying that sheriff's deputies are required to transport individuals from correctional facilities to certain hearings and other places, which I don't think should be happening according to what is in statute, but I don't know that, but I just want to put that out there that our sheriffs are being pulled in so many directions and there are so few of them that I'm, I'm just really concerned that all of this work that we're asking them to do is not going to get done. And it's all necessary work, right? I mean, somebody's got to do it. And it seems like the legislature feels like, oh, it's just really easy. Just tell the sheriffs they got to do it. Um, and I, would, I would say that this draft takes a big step back <laughs> here from, sure. from the sure. demands that yeah. were put on sheriffs that were in S-17. And, I, and, and that's great. Yeah, so I, we're trying to head in that direction. That's, <laughs> right. that's fine. I'm just, this is the day for me to lay it out all, all out on the table. No, I, I, that's, I, 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 I love it. <laughs> I think we're, we're making a, a lot of progress here. <laughs> um, Great. Uh, uh, all right. So, anything more on the uh, section five B? All right. So let's plow ahead. The next part of the bill pertains to sheriff's duties. This is section six. Um, the new duties, which were introduced by the Senate, two of the three are reserved uh, as the Senate had them. Those being the uh, sheriff's being required to maintain a work schedule and the requirement that uh, sheriff's deputies, um, sheriff's departments provide, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, that they comply with the provisions of standard operating procedures and manuals and policies created by, maintained by DSAS. Uh, it does modify the um, uh, new duty um, pertain, uh, relating to uh, the provision of escort services for uh, survivors of domestic violence, essentially removing the affirmative duty for sheriffs to provide that service, but maintaining the prohibition on um, seeking fees for that service, fees from victims, that is. And it will now read, starting in line 11, subsection D, the sheriff's department shall not seek a fee from an individual who has a relief from abuse order pursuant to Title 15 VSA, Section 1103, or any representative of that individual for providing assistance in the retrieval of the individual's personal belongings from the individual's residence. Sir. 
And before I go to Representative Hango, uh, I just want to highlight something that Tim just said so everybody's kind of got a top of mind before we talk about this section. So in S17, it said sheriffs will be the ones who do this work when there's an RFA, period. Um, and the feedback we heard in testimony, uh, and I got in several emails, <laughs> I don't know if you all got it, was that there are lots of law enforcement agencies that do this work already, um, and some charge and some don't. And so I think there was broad agreement um, that uh, it, it's probably not good practice to have the uh, sort of a victim of, or survivor, I should say, of domestic violence have to pay a direct fee to law enforcement in order to accommodate this, but um, that uh, the mandate that the sheriff be the only one doing it that was implied, or maybe it was explicit actually in um, S-17 as it passed the Senate. So it took away that mandate, acknowledging that in some places the local police department or, or some other law enforcement agency might be doing that work. And basically just said, you know, the department shouldn't charge a fee when they have to do that, at least remove that mandate. Representative Hancock. Thank you. My question is with what remains from S-17 on line five on page 10, that the sheriff shall maintain a record of the sheriff's work schedule, including et cetera, et cetera. So I'm disappointed that that's still in there because um, the nature of a sheriff's work tends to be confidential in some respects in that they may be doing investigations, um, they may be um, trying to solve a case. I, I don't even know how to put it, but why and, and who, well, never mind the why because it's in there, but who will be able to view, I think we heard this as a question from a witness, who will be able to view this sheriff's work schedule? Will it be public? And how will that affect the sheriff's ability to get their work done? I don't know if that's a question that anybody who's yeah. here at the table can answer, but Tim did you talk can. about the, the public records? Exactly. <laughs> um, the Public Records Act would be in play here in this uh, work schedule would be subject to request by anybody who asked. And I don't like that because um, of the sometimes confidential nature of the work that a law enforcement officer has to do. Uh, even, um, even if the sheriff themselves are not the ones going out on patrol or going out to investigate, they still would be involved in um, in this type of confidential work. Um, and, and they're an elected official, right? So what other elected officials do we have who have to publish their daily work schedule for the general public to look at? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Represent Boyden. I'm wondering how detailed the work schedule needs to be in order to be published. Um, because like, could they just say, if I work Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m.? Um, or does it need to be, I went to lunch with so-and-so, or I'm doing an investigation for this? As I read it, Tim, to, to that point, it's just that they have to say which days they worked, which days they were taking leave, and when they were working remotely outside of their district. Those are the only pieces of information. And past tense, not future tense. I will be working these days because that's my concern. Sure. I would want people to, I, if I were the sheriff, I would not want them, the general public, to know when I was going to see them go to town. For oh, instance, it's all doing a patrol. It's past tense, right? So they have to keep a record of what they've, what they've done, they've not, done, not, not an agenda of what they're planning on doing. Right? If a sheriff were to create a record of, let's say, just have a calendar and input something in the future. <laughs> Um, and somebody requested it today. Um, that would be subject to the Public Records Act, and then um, that notification or that event would be part of the record that would have to be uh, presented, subject to exemptions under the Public Record Act. So there are um, there is a very long list of exemptions of information that doesn't necessarily have to be or can be. Uh, released to the public and 
certain elements of personal information, um, uh, information having to do with the conduct of ongoing investigation and criminal procedures, I know off the top of my head, just you know, to a certain degree are exempted from public release. So building on that, I have no problem with the sheriff giving their, um, their work schedule to the body that hires them, that contracts with them, like for instance, the town select board. If they need to know when the sheriff is expected to be in their town, and then for whatever reason, and this is happening, that the sheriff doesn't show up to do that patrol, they can then immediately get on that and say, hey, we noticed you weren't here, what happened? But for the general public to know, that's my concern. I have no problem with, with contractual, this is my work schedule, these are the days I actually worked type of thing. And wouldn't any, today, absent this, any documentation that a uh, sheriff's office has about, you know, for instance, how many hours do they patrol in each community they have a contract with? All of that's subject to public record request now, isn't it? Correct. And the general public has access to any data from any elected official unless it's explicitly covered as exempt. For instance, the personal information that Tim mentioned, but it's stuff about, you know, how many hours patrolled and, and things like that, those records would all be and in the past tense, or in a general statement, I will be in your town for 40 hours the week of April 20th. I, I'm good with that, but I have heard town officials express concern that if the general public knows that the sheriff will be here between 5 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Friday the 21st, that that becomes an issue with folks who are paying attention to the sheriff's schedule and maybe engaging in activity that they should not be engaging in under the law. I don't think that this language that's here addresses um, any specificity about like where the sheriff's working or kind of their patrol strategy, um, those pieces, which would be subject to public records requests. I don't think they would be advertised, which I think is the point maybe that you're bringing up Representative Hango. This too would be, it's a, it's a requirement that there be a record of when the sheriff worked, took leave, and a remote work. Um, just like that language came over from the Senate, and I believe, and maybe Tim can correct me if I'm wrong, that they looked for a much greater level of specificity initially because of some of the, there were concerns about a couple of sheriffs who people were even questioning whether they were still in state for a good period of time. Um, which is where I think this comes from. But Tim, did they, did they initially have things about hourly and, and more they details? Originally, they had the word detail uh, work schedule, and then they removed the word detail. So one last question, Tim. Does this apply to just the sheriff or the sheriff's deputies as well? Because it doesn't really say. As written, it will apply to only the sheriffs, not any other employees of the um, of course, this is a mandate to um, create records. Doesn't necessarily um, prevent deputies or other employees in the sheriff's department from creating records and forming work schedules. And that may be a condition of employment in those uh, departments as well. Thanks. Any other questions on uh, section six? <clears throat> All right, we're in the home stretch here. <laughs> um, no modifications have been made to Senate Section 7 of the bill. Section 7A is a new section added from the to the uh, S-17 titled Sheriff's Deputy Provision of Courthouse Security, Demicolon Report. And read through <laughs> On or before December 1st, 2023, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, in con consultation with the Judiciary, shall report to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs and the Senate Committee on Government Operations on the required number of sheriff's deputies that need to be made available to provide law enforcement and security services to county and state courthouses to facilitate regular courthouse operations. 
The department shall also provide recommendations to adjust the number of sheriff's deputies necessary to accomplish uh, facilitating regular courthouse operations and develop a budget request for any necessary additional sheriff's deputies. So um, before we get into discussion of this section, I will just preface this by saying this is basically a placeholder. I don't know what to do about this issue right yeah. now. It's so sticky. It's just, yeah, we all know we need courthouse security. Who pays for it and who can employ by whom is a really thorny question. If we can make some progress on it in the next few days, fantastic. But I don't know if we can do the mandate that's in seven without doing something else on the budget side or at least specifying that that increased funding that was requested and that the House Judiciary Committee supported when they were here for the Board Administration as well. I don't, know, just, I don't know what to do about it right now. So basically, this is just a, I don't know what to do <laughs> right, right now. I represent Morgan. I'm just going to throw on the table. Yeah, exactly. I concur because um, of dealing with the, the Grand Isle uh, County situation with their courthouse right now, they, their contract folks from the judiciary because they just don't have the manpower to provide courthouse security. I, they're just now getting... Um, more fully staffed, and I think you and I know why. <laughs> it's a result of something else that has occurred. So, uh, but but uh, uh, anyway, uh, but regardless of that, it, it's not a guarantee at any given place in time that any department in the 14 counties is going to be able or not be able to do. So I just, it's, we just need to be mindful of that as well. Like as this, so it's a it's a sticky wicket. Yes, yeah. yeah, I get it. And, and there's um. I just started to really dig in this a little bit, but there are some memos from the years that um, members of House Judiciary have shared with me. Um, a lot of stuff from um, Terry Corsoni's that, that would, you know, that basically talks about the long history of this. And we heard a little bit from her and others about, you know, there there is a budget increase in the hourly compensation in the sort of statewide. Yeah. Um, to, I think in the budget this year, we're taking some steps in the right direction in terms of trying to support the staffing but um i think this this fundamental question of um should they be more like the transport deputies is something that uh, seems like a good suggestion i'm not sure that in the context of you know a budget that's probably 95 percent along its way um, that we're going to be able to do but i have some questions that i'd like us over the next few days to ask appropriations the judiciary and the court administrator and see if there's something better we can do on this issue but uh, as of today, I'm not sure what it is. Representative Cooper, go ahead. And this issue is restricted to 25. Well, so here's the thing. Well, no, no, no. that's 25. I want to be careful about that because I think that if I understood that correctly, that would be like if you wanted to say the mandated one deputy for every courthouse, you would need 25 positions. I think to get there, we'd have to start with what is the gap that we're trying to fill today and how many positions would it take for us to fill the gap? And we phase in more of those over time. I don't think there's any scenario where we can realistically, in one budget year, put add 25 positions and say we have this whole new fleet of deputies. I also think that that would disrupt existing contracts that exist that are going well, where one sheriff's department has the staff and they're fully contracted with the courthouses and it works great. It does in a few places, but. Yeah, I, wonder, I inferred from what somebody said the other day that maybe some of the transport deputies were being used for something else when they didn't have any transport stuff to do, which then is completely inappropriate. But one of the other sheriffs said their transport deputies are a, a block that comes and never goes. And the difference for me, I think, is that if you don't give them benefits and that guarantee you're looking at a part-time job somebody's going to look for another job when they have the opportunity and if you want a permanent and functional staff you probably have to go the way of making them employees not at wills yeah and the, and the flip side of that the problem that 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 we're having now is we are paying for private contractors that don't have the the same ability that a certified law enforcement officer would have to actually assist the courthouses and maintain the public safety that they want so yeah, right know. now we're spending money on private security that you know doesn't really do 
do as much as the what we heard uh, no, the junior think, senior would like it to be. Post COVID, we have the luxury of allowing courthouses to close because of staffing issues. Still, a big backlog. Yeah, so we're the, the the interests of keeping the courthouses open and safe uh, at the same time. Uh, I think we've taken a step in the right direction with adding some more money to the budget mm -hmm. um, and increasing the compensation to try to get those per diem folks who are attached to the courthouses. Um, but I just don't think we've, I think there's a clear answer to this problem right now that we can just drop into this bill. Uh, but maybe there's a step we can make in the right direction soon. So oh, definitely going to need to take some more testimony on this section and uh, see what we can do. <laughs> Sections eight and nine of the bill have not been modified. Sorry, eight has not been. Um, actually, note nine has not been either. Uh, the next new addition we'll see highlighted, and that's on page 12, is a new section titled uh, Reading Assistant Heading. It reads Sheriff's Department's Reform Report. The new section 10, and this will replace what was what the Senate had as uh, the creation of a Sheriff's Department's Oversight Task Force. We'll now have a report uh, required here, which will have DSAS in consultation with some other entities, uh, considered largely the same issues uh, relating to the oversight of the Sheriff's Department. On line three, Section 10 reads, Sheriff's Department reform, semicolon report. On or before November 15th, 2023, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, in consultation with the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, the Auditor of Accounts, the Vermont Association of County Judges, the Chief Superior Court Judge, and the Vermont Sheriff's Association, shall report to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs and the Senate Committee on Government Operations on the following. One, Recommended policies and best practices to be included in standard operating procedures. Skip down to five, which is new. Recommended membership and duties of an advisory commission for sheriffs comparable to or compared combined with the Vermont State Police Advisory Commission as related to both conduct and administration of sheriff's departments. New language in six reads the creation of a sustainable funding model for sheriff's departments, including the consolidation or reorganization of sheriff's departments. And let's see, those are what has been modified or added um, there. And uh, Representative Newton has a question. Yes. Um, on that section about consolidation, um, I'm reading that as almost as if it's required. And I was wondering if that was the intent or if it's just something that we want to make sure um, is put on the table as an option. So um, I guess I, I would answer that by zooming, zooming back out. Um, the Senate created uh, an oversight task force, brought in a bunch of people who are already in large part working on law enforcement reform issues, you know, specifically the Criminal Justice Council. We heard testimony yesterday that uh, probably a good step would be to have um, the department just do a report for us. And so I really tried to scale down the like, what do we really need to spend money on and have people being asked to do an official set of meetings or because I think we're going to be working on these issues more here. Like, at length and in the way that the task force was defined, I think there's actually a lot of that information out there and there are really policy decisions for us to consider. Um, I took a lot of the things the Senate recommended and then I added a few things. Um, but I guess, you know, do, do you have a, a sense of, you know, and if people think that there should be changes to, to this, I'm, I'm not married to, to these, but I, the general gist of this is I'm going from having a whole bunch of people be required to meet in session law, doing a whole big task force to telling the department, go out and talk to the people you already work with and summarize some of these things for us so that when we get back here in January, we actually have some ideas to chew on. Yeah. 
I guess, yeah, it would make sense to me, given where we're at, from what I understand, that it would be good to put that on the table as an option, but not necessarily require it. Yeah, I tried to leave things to say, look at this, but don't, yeah, I, I, I try not to go quite as far in terms of where, where I wanted him to go on any of these issues as maybe the Senate language in a couple of places. Representative Boyden. Um, this would be a silly question, but is it, are we asking for just one report or an annual? Uh, just, I only meant this to be one, one report. Okay. Yeah. I just want to clear one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I think there's a, there's more uh, there's more work that we're going to have to do. <laughs> That's pretty clear. And there's some issues we left on the table. Or, uh, so I think we're just not going to get everything done this year. Um, and uh, it's going to be an evolving mm -hmm. conversation. And I don't know if it makes sense to ask all the entities that were listed in that task force to have formal meetings over the summer. And we have all, I think we're not quite there yet because the questions, I don't think we even fully determine the questions that we would want to ask them. I personally think that there should be a broader conversation over the next several years about how many sheriffs do we need? Could there be consolidation and reorganization? This touches on that. Um, you know, it may be that we really do want to keep the constitutional historical thing of 14 sheriffs in 14 counties. But I think that that's a question that this body is going to have to wrestle with. And if we, you know, at, if we want to go to a task force that's going to talk about that and bring everybody informally, I think we need to better define what the questions are that we're asking. And, you know, report from the folks who are already working in these areas and are the experts that work on this stuff every day is, I think, that going to be a valuable addition to our conversations next year. Great. I think we've almost made it. <laughs> the only uh, last section is 11 pertaining to effective dates. And the only modification here is that it pumps out the effective date for section five to January 1st, 2024. Section five is the um, amended language to the sheriff's contracting provision, that 5% that we've been talking about and how the uh, what's proposed in this amendment to S17 will um, require those expenditures of those funds to be in accordance with the model policy. The model policy will be put into place by January 1st, uh, 2024. So um, giving time for the pieces to fit together, I suppose. So thank you all. Uh, a lot of good feedback and ideas that'll inform another round on this. Uh, we'll come back to this. Uh, probably next week. Um, and so I'll look forward to folks have other thoughts and ideas that we should ask them about on this, but I think we're uh, now due to hear a couple of uh, drive-throughs on other bills uh, that we've been asked to give a gap before they get on their way. So uh, Tim, thank you very much for your hard work on this. Have you back in next week, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you.